hit new. And then under template file, hit browse. And then find that template. And if anybody has questions or needs help, just raise your hand. Allah will come and help you. Yep, new, and then I'll come up with a project template. The copied elevation was ringing through, right? The copied level? Yeah. yeah. Good. Dude, what is with your computer, man? Um, so where do you say this one is one of it? Yeah, that is the one of it. Yeah. And it's also going to be in the last one. Yeah. Okay. You have to press the new pause and move my out. I kept saying this can't be done. Yeah. You should also add it to your new credits that way you don't have to do it. If not, you have a wonderful video to review. Did you have it open before? You've been sitting here for like 20 minutes. Oh, you have? Alright. Did everybody get to this point? Or is the majority? No. Any other issues? Wonderful. Okay, so we have our three levels, level one, level two, and roof. Um, so we want to go to level one and start building our template or building our footprint. So right now, if we look at our sketch, it's mostly a rectilinear uh, base, and then it branches out with this gigantic cantilever on the second floor. So that's what we'll do. Go to floor, and then under floor, let's just select generic 12 inch right now. All right. So once we get a rectangle, let's make it one hundred feet long. And let's make it 40 feet width. Seems about right. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> no, so like you can definitely do it um, if you have like a line tool. So let's say we wanted to do a 50 foot, you can type in 50 and I'll go 50. Um, but typically, especially like using some of the rectilinear uh, tools and other stuff, um, it's much easier to just draw it and then go back in and change the dimension afterwards. Drawing floor. So go into architecture. Oh, you got them. You're in modify floor, right? On the top right, does it say modify create floor boundary? Yes. That's because you're in the floor creation world. So if you're in the floor create like a create floor boundary, you're only able to create a floor boundary. Everything else gets grayed out. You're not able to edit it until you hit that green check mark. One hundred. Doesn't matter. Just draw a rectangle. Majority of y'all catch caught up? Yeah? Alright. Um, so what I just did, for those of you that were following, so I just threw dimensions on here, and when I did, they were pretty tiny and out of scale. So in the bottom left-hand corner as well, uh, I will just stay there. In the bottom left-hand corner, there is a scale, one-eighth inch equals a foot. So if you click that, it comes up with a bunch of preset scales that you can select from. And if you want that text larger, you go to a smaller scale because the smaller it is, the larger the font's going to be. Uh, the way Revit works is that this kind of font, so the font that's in your dimensions, any font that you put down, it's at a preset scale depending on the scale of the drawing. So if it's uh, if your text is an inch tall, whether it's you know three thirty or a thirty second of an inch equals a foot or a quarter of an inch equals a foot, that's font is going to stay the same size so it's all relative to the scale of the drawing so if you go to a larger scale that font gets real tiny all right so you can just go to 132nd inch equals a foot press the big check mark that is how you complete whatever modification task you are under so just a quick fyi when you guys are still in the paint you see one of the lines has three, two dashes on top of it. That's the direction of your deck. So because the decking is one directional, that, that shows the direction of which way your floor is standing. Just a bit. Just in case you wanted to know. All right. And that also, um, just like with a roof, you can define the slope of a floor. For if you wanted to create a ramp and you just wanted to use the floor tool, um, that check mark box up there, you can do that, and you're able to import a slope. Let's not do that, though. Let's just keep everything flat. Press check. Yes. No, he's not raising his hand. All right. So let's go to level two. So when we go to level two, we cannot see what we've done in level one, and that is because our view range is only penetrating... Um, the level two. So a view range is how far within the drawing relative to the view that you are in um, that you can see. So under the properties tab on the right, um, down about halfway down, so a tab called view range. If you go in and hit edit, right there for you, Aaron. There you go. Edit. All right. So it gives you a top, bottom, the cut plane, so where in relative terms to the level you are on it's being cut, and then how far that view depth is. So how far in the view can you see? So right now, 
it's um, being cut about 20 feet above the cut plane for some reason. Let's go to four feet, which is your typical. Oops. Go to four feet. That's a pretty standard dimension across the profession as you take the floor boundary or the floor cut four feet above the finished floor height. Um, and then under view depth, let's just put unlimited. <coughs> So that means that everything under this view, under that cup plane, which is four feet above level two, you can see. Sometimes you want to turn that off in case there's a bunch of information down below that you don't want to see. All right, and then once you're done with that, press OK. And now we can see our level one floor slab. Now the reason we want to see that is because in our building, we know that we want to offset and cantilever out about five or six feet from that first floor footprint as well as cantilever out this gigantic let's call it a bedroom for right now so let's go back to floor yes which part the view range under properties you have view range so you have the top of the view properties uh, mid range down, V range. Yeah, so when you when you have nothing selected, that defaults your properties to the view that you're in's properties. If you select an element, it then goes to the properties of the selected element. So when you select it, the floor, you get four properties. When you select off and you don't have anything selected, it goes back to the view. Does that make sense? I know. There's a lot of information in here that can get complicated. So when you have your view range uh, figured out, go back to floor. And now since we have the floor below, visible what we can do is under the drawing tab uh, in the bottom right corner there's a pick lines it's a mouse with, uh, over a green line you can select that guy and now you can either go through and click all the edges of the existing floor plan to get the the exact boundary of that floor below or you can highlight or uh, yeah, highlight over one of the edges and hit tab a couple times until you get it. And then you get a chain or the complete boundary of the element that you are on. Okay. Everybody caught up? Wait, you not? Do you not have your? Do you not have Revit? I'm, I'm, I'm done. You're done? Oh, you I'm did the whole thing? <laughs> Good. All right. So looking back at the sketch, so we'll have one side cantilevered about five feet. Let's do that pretty standard. And then we'll have one extending all the way out. So going back to our box. So under modify tab, we have an offset command, just like we do in Rhino and in CAD. And then underneath um, the ribbon window, modify create floor boundary. You can change the offset value to, uh, let's do six feet, making a nice big offset. And then next to that, it has a copy check mark. So you can either have the offset copy that line, so it keeps the original and creates another one, or you can uncheck that and it will actually move the line out. We want to have that off since we don't want two lines. So offset those two floors and then we got to create this big cantilever so we got to draw some new stuff so go back to your draw tab select a single line let's go what's that? Yeah, so let's go over. So if you're in offset, depending on which side of the line you are on, that's the side that it's going to offset. So if you're, and it, it's somewhat delicate, so just be careful. 
because sometimes you can accidentally hit the other side. So if you have copy turned off, whatever lines it's chained to, those lines will extend out. That's one of the nice things about not, not copying. All right, so moving on. So we need to create that cantilever. So let's make it a 40 foot wide cantilever. And one way we can do that, so we can just highlight that line with a single line draw tool. Highlight over around 40 feet that we can see with that dimension down there. And then go out. Let's go out 40 feet. Now, we'll use the trim and extend tool to extend this line out and connect it with this guy and then trim this line back to connect with this guy. It is up in the modify tab. It's trim and extend to corner. Shortcut TR. And you just click the two lines that you want to either trim or, or extend to. Revit will automatically recognize what it needs to do to get those uh, two lines to line up. That's it. Yeah. Uh, 40 feet, it's really, it's whatever you want it to be. It's 40 by 40. And then it's a trim and extend tool. I'm recording all of this too, so you'll have this to, to go over once you're done. Yeah. Pick lines. So, so the trim button is is this? Oh, it's on. You just click one line. And click the other. No. So if you if you click this side of the line and trim that end, you wanna you wanna understand? Yeah, click here. Oh, I I understood. Oh, it. Yeah. Yep. So you wanna click this line and that line to cut, so that they can do something. Yeah. If your boundary is not closed, it will not let you do a checkpoint. You can manage. Yeah. You can put lines. You can offset lines. You can. Yeah, so if you manually wanted to, to trim or extend this line, just click the line. It will give you two blue points on either side of it. To then move those, you just click that point and move it down. You got it? That was it? Cool. Is there logic to what it's trying to do? Well, so it... It looks for the intersection of those two points, and it you will either trim down that line and move the endpoint to meet the other one, or it will extend it. Correct. Yeah. So let's say this is extended out, right? I know I want to keep this side. I know I want to keep this side of the line. So I make sure that I select that side of the line. Now if I did the opposite, if I selected this side and then trimmed it, it would trim the opposite way. Does no matter what order you go into? No. What? Yeah. And it's a lot of like little minute details in it too that are are hard. The one thing about Revit, right, is it's a plain based modeling so, uh, software. So it any element that you are creating, it needs to know exactly where in space that you're creating it from. 
That's why, like, you create the level one and level two views, unlike uh, Rhino, which is just a free-form environment that has X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, and that's construction. Uh, you need to know exactly where you are in space uh, and need to be able to convey that to the contractor. Where you start typing Revit shortcuts in Rhino and Rhino Yeah, right. All right, so when we get to that point, let's look back. So that's pretty close. Relative. All right, so once you get that and make sure that the boundary is closed, press check. It will create four. All right, so now we'll create the roof. So we created the roof level in the elevation. However, the roof plan did not show up in the views. So we need to go and create that. Any new level that you create, it won't automatically create that floor plan. You need to go in and tell it to create the floor plan associated with that level. So under view, go to plan views, and hit floor plan. So I think I went over this last time, but in um, your creation of floor plans, it's going to show you all of the levels that you haven't created a floor plan for. If you want to create a duplicate floor plan, down here under that check mark that says do not duplicate existing views, uncheck that, and it will show you all the levels within the project that you can create a floor plan from. It was. All right. So selecting roof, which should be your only view. Uncheck that. And then just like the other uh, level two, we need to adjust the view range. Now you have one line on each side and you fit it. Oh. See, these are the correct cut planes. So four feet. And then under view depth, just go to unlimited. Press OK. You should see the second floor plan. Another thing that just came up when uh, she was she had two lines on top of each other when she was editing the floor and they were hidden so you, you don't see it in space but when you try to finish the floor it gives you an error telling you you have lines overlapping so you have to go through and tab over the lines and make sure you don't have two on top of each other. What's that? Uh, so for the view range. The cut plane should always be approximately four feet above your level, and then the view depth is unlimited. All right. So I'll go over that just in case you guys uh, run into it when you're modeling. So let's say we have two lines over each other. So it's going to tell you when you actually draw those lines that they're uh, overlapping, but let's say we just miss that close that error out. If we go to try and checkbox this, it's going to tell you that lines are intersecting each other and then it's going to highlight in orange where those intersections are. So you need to continue and then go in, find that hidden line, delete it, and then press check and you should be okay. Alright, and it will tell you all of that. It will also tell you Let's say you have two lines that aren't joined all the way. And you try and check. It will highlight those two tabs that are open. And you just got to close them up. Make sense? All right, so let's go to our roof. Now, our roof plan is going to be the same exact profile as our second floor is. But... We need to make it an actual roof. So let's go to the architecture tab, and then under roof, we'll just do roof by fruit, yeah, footprint. Footprint. All right. So create the the roof pro, uh, footprint environment, and then under roof, under the properties tab, let's see if we have a generic, yeah, generic 12 inch, which for some reason is green. 
All right, and then just like we did with the second floor plan, or second floor, excuse me, we can just go in to the pick lines tool, hover over the second floor tab until you get the entire boundary of that floor, and then press check. All right. So, got it. Keep that up. Mm -hmm. So when you highlight it, or you highlight it with your mouse, you just hit tab. And that's another thing too. If you have two elements, multiple elements on top of each other, that's how you cycle through them. So right now it's selecting the roof. If I tab through, now it's selecting the floor below that, and then the floor. Well, actually, it goes back to the roof. Um, all right. So if we go up to the default 3D view, click that guy. We should see. This outline. All right, so let's go back to our house. All right, so those floor slabs are actually a little bit thin, so we'll want to go in and adjust those so they're a little bit thicker. Just FYI, that's not actually how they create those, um, but for our sake, we will just do that. So let's select our roof, go to edit type. It'll bring up the roof properties, type properties. Under structure, hit edit. And then just go to, let's say, 2.5 feet, 2.5 feet. Press OK. Press OK. Now we got a thick roof. You know that last part where you're entering 25, how do you got that many? The 25? Yeah, this is the generic 12 inch. Okay. Yep, so just 12 inch, right? So you control the different uh, the different types of, of roofs or different types of floors, right? So it, yeah, it says 12 inch. That's just the name that you give it. So since we have gone into the structure and changed the thickness of it to two and a half, if you're being really good about your Revit organization, uh, you then go in and rename your floor generic 30 inch or two foot six or whatever you want to call it. What's strange? I only have like three layers, I guess, on I have three what? I really need a larger So every time then you would like to generic uh, yeah, in this specific Revit. So that's why I went in and renamed it 30 inch. So when you're under here, you can either duplicate that view or duplicate that floor. That'll create a copy of it um, in case you wanted it to keep that 12 inch, 12 inches. Um, or you can just go in and rename it. And you can rename it whatever. I mean, it doesn't have to be 30 inches. It can be like project roof. Really simple. That's sometimes what we do because depending on the type of roof that we get later on in the project, we'll have to go in and edit those um, those properties. So 
we keep it somewhat generic in the beginning. No. No. So these are all the type pro or type parameters. So they are specific to this specific floor type. If you press OK, all the these guys within the properties tab, those are the instance parameter. So in this specific instance, for this specific roof, if I want to make it five feet above the level, the, uh, then it changes for that specific roof. But it won't change it for every roof that I have in the project. Anybody not follow that? Anybody need help? All right, so let's do that for the floor. So select the second floor, second level floor, go to edit type, underneath construction, edit the structure, go in, change that to two and a half feet, 2.5 feet. You can also type in two foot six inches, doesn't really matter. Press OK, and then we can rename that 30 inch floor. Press OK. And if you notice, when we change the thickness of the, the general 12 inch floor, it also changed the thickness for the other generic 12 inch floor in the project. That is why it's a type parameter because it changes that specific dimension for all of that, all of the floors that are under that type. That makes it really easy when you have a lot of the same element within the project, whether that be a wall or a floor or whatnot. If you want to, if you have to change it for whatever reason, then it populates throughout the entire project. You don't have to go in and edit 70 different walls or you know, 14 floors. Okay. All right. So let's make some walls. <coughs> All right. So let's go back to level one and then go under architecture tab, the first tab in there, wall. All right. So we can just keep, let's do a generic 12 inch. Keep it real simple. Let's go back to the image. Okay. So they mostly have a solid wall here and then uh, glazing around. So let's do that. So, okay. Under location line, let's change that from wall center line to finish face exterior. That makes the selection line on the edge instead of in the middle. So we can go around the perimeter of the floor much easier. The other thing we'll want to do is under the properties, change the top constraint of the wall. So right now, its base is at level one. Right now, its top constraint is unconnected. It's just at an unconnected height of 14 feet. If we go under the top constraint, drop down, go to level two, that will automatically go to level two. And then that will also update. If you ever change the height of level two, it will automatically move that wall up and down with level two. So let's go to the bottom right corner. Go up a little bit. Let's go back to that image. Go in. All right, and then I know that was really complicated. What's that? I'm just picking a random dimension, just proportional to what's going on in this image. Which actually looks more like half. So let's drag this up a little bit. You also click and drag the walls. So when you see that four directional arrow, and then just click and drag. Did you say you did first to finish phase exterior? Yep. Huh? It doesn't matter. It's a generic wall, it has no components. 
associated with it. So when um, when it's really important for you guys to distinguish between the finished face exterior and finished face face interior is let's say uh, really quick. You don't have to follow along with this. Let's go to like a uh, yeah half inch chips and wall board on metal stud. So this is your typical half inch drywall on a metal stud wall. So you zoom in, go to fine detail. So depending on where that um, location line is, it will draw based on how the wall is constructed. So right now the exterior face of this wall is the stud and the inside is the drywall. And you can see that that half inch right there, that's the drywall. This other part is the stud. Um, and then you can flip the location of the line based on where that location line is. We'll get into that a little bit more actually right now because we have to go in um, right here. I'm just going to pretend like that's a wood plank wall right here. Um, and so we can go in and create a new wall. So if you go to the wall tab, select it, and then go back down to our 12 inch generic model, generic 12 inch, go to edit type. And now let's duplicate this wall and change the name to wood plank. Press OK. And then under edit structure. So in edit structure, you can do several things. Um, you can change the thickness like we did last time. You can also change the material of the wall. And this is where you can build different layers into um, the wall structure. So right now it's just a default category um, of material. If you click the right-hand side of this column uh, right here, it'll come up with a dot, dot, dot little tab. That will open up the materials library within Revit. And then you have all these different materials that you can choose from. Everybody follow? All right, so under wood stained, not that I love that color at all. Uh, this is where you can start to control the different colors and textures associated with um, the materials. So under graphics, this is all of the the, um, the parameters that you can choose to edit the, the drawings. Um, so if you create a section, if you create an, a true elevation, this is where you can start to change and manipulate um, the patterns. So since we have, let's see, a pretty horizontal plank wall, go under the surface pattern, click pattern, We'll bring up a bunch of different options. Let's hope we have horizontal lines. There we go. Can click a horizontal or horizontal small, whichever you prefer. Does everybody have horizontal small? Mm -hmm. Good. I didn't know if it might bring in Little's library. All right, press OK. And then under color, so this, since we have selected a, a specific pattern, the color underneath it actually dictates the color of the line work of the pattern. So we'll actually change the horizontal lines, not the solid color underneath that. So you can change that to brown, you can change it to gray, you can do whatever you want. All right? Now, underneath here, and we don't, we're not going to start editing those, but you can also dictate what the cut pattern is of a certain material. So let's say wood... Uh, is typically uh, a diagonal hatch. That's what the cut pattern is down here. You can change it to solid if you want it to be a poche. You can change it to, I don't know, star pattern if you really wanted to. Um, but for right now, just make sure your foreground, foreground surface pattern is horizontal of some nature. Press OK. Press OK again. Press OK a third time. Alright, so now we have wood plank highlighted as our wall. Let's create a 
wall. All right, so now we have our three walls. Make that a little shorter. All right, and now we have our glass wall. Whoops. All right, so we have a glass wall that comes up and around and then ends, terminates with a wood panel. So we'll do that now. So under wall, you have a couple curtain wall examples. Curtain wall, exterior glazing, storefront. Uh, let's just choose storefront for right now since that's uh, actually what the glass type is. For those of you who don't know, storefront is um, any kind of glazing system, like what we see in the back, that is technically storefront. It is um, supported by the floor or um, ground underneath it, and then has um, lateral support from the perimeter and the ceiling. Curtain wall is actually hung, so it is hung from the floor slab and has all of its weight um, coming from the top or excuse me, the portion that is connected to the floor. Um, you can do significantly larger areas and heights of glass with a curtain wall system compared to a storefront. Storefront, you're typically, uh, you're typically limited to about 12 to 14 feet high. Um, higher than that, you typically need a, another support and it just makes more uh, sense economically to go to curtain wall. It's a quick professional lesson. All right, so if we go to the edit type under storefront. All right, so it looks actually like it's pretty close to what that is already. Uh, so um, we don't have any horizontal mullions coming across the face. So underneath the horizontal grid layout, instead of having a fixed distance and having a mullion come in at 8 feet, we can just go to none. Maximum spacing five feet for the vertical layout. That's fine. All right, press OK. And then go out to the edge. Go across. All right. And then we will finish with another wood plank wall. Everybody caught up? Looks like everybody's slipping away. So I just escaped out of the curtain wall and then went back to the wall component. And then under the drop down, just went back up and selected wood plank. Yep. Yeah, to get out of um, certain elements, you just have to press escape. That's going to be a pretty typical command. Any way to change where you put your wall if you don't want it on the center line after you've already made it for use to redraw? Mm -hmm. No, you can change it. Uh, which I'll show you right now. So, this guy down here, this is at least where I would like it, uh, in the center of the, the wood plank wall. And up here, it's actually gone to the outside. So, um, we can do a couple different things to adjust that. Under Modify, the first button underneath the Modify tab is called Align. It's got the two kind of bar graph looking components. If you click that, it's going to prompt you for the first line. And that first line is what you're going to align or get into parallel with um, the second component. So uh, you show, so right now it's highlighting the center of that wood plank wall. So if I click that, then it creates this dash line that is running across the entirety of the project. And it's going to align whatever element you select next with that dashed line. So if I select and hover over the storefront center line and click, it shifts that storefront to the center of the wood plank wall. You can do that with 
the outside edge. So it automatically defaults to the center line. If you want to get that outside edge of the wall, you have to hit tab. It will highlight the outside edge in blue. If you click that, it creates that dashed line across, moves it out. And just like in every other program, Control Z is undo. And then another thing to remember uh, with working with walls, so with this storefront, the glass, which I'm highlighting right now, so that's a glass system. Right now it is inset into the interior. If we wanted to reverse that and have it facing the front, all we have to do is select the wall and either press enter and it will flip the wall along the center line of that wall or you click these two uh, reverse area, uh, arrows excuse me and it if you hover over it saying change walls orientation it will do the same thing spacebar is just a shortcut for that so we'll do that with that so it won't automatically put a column in the corner no, no. We'll get into that when we go over curtain walls. Um, so there are different uh, mullion pattern or mullions that are corner mullions that you can put in. You can also do custom ones. Um, yeah, for what you guys are doing, we'll do some custom uh, curtain wall or excuse me, custom mullions to to get, capture that. Um, in real projects. You typically wait for shops, um, and then you can specify exactly what type you want. Or you draw it in uh, 2D, which is sometimes typical, too. Uh, is that how you guys do it? Yeah, we typically wait for the shop to come in, and then we just tell them how we want it, how we want it to look. Mm -hmm. We don't try to model it. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a pain. Um, so now we have this guy. So if we go to our 3D view, we can check to see. And so the one thing that is happening right now is since our floor, so if we under, so on the top right, there's a little box um, or a cube, excuse me, um, and it has different orientation labels on it. So if you click one of those, it will go to that true orientation. Uh, I use that a lot because um, it helps with modifying and editing. So right now our walls are going right up to the floor or the level. But our floor is technically the top of it is at that level and drops down 30 inches. So what we need to do is go in and change all of these walls for our top constraint, drop it down 30 inches. And to do that quickly, if you highlight over one and then hit tab, it will highlight every wall in the chain that's connected to each other or joined together. So you can click that. So if you click, it will highlight all of them. And then on the right under properties, since you have multiple different wall types selected, it will just come up as multiple families. But it will show you every single shared type property associated with those. And right now, pretty much every one is shared. They all start at level one. Their base offset is zero. And what we want to do to manipulate that is to go to the top offset. Remember, whatever we type in, we can type in a positive number and it will go over the level, that top constraint, or we can type in a negative number and it will go down. So we want it to drop down 30 inches below the level. So we just select that, type in negative 30 inches, hit enter, and just an FYI, if you have your mouse still on the right side under properties, it's not going to do anything. You have to move your mouse over to the drawing window and then it will actually do what you just typed in. That's to make sure that you do all of the different changes that you want and make sure that you type them in correctly before it does. Otherwise, it would just update as soon as you typed it in. So. Um, would this be a case where you want to attach it to the piece of the You can. Uh, So you can, and I'll show you how to do that now. Um, it's typically a, we don't typically do that in practice. Now, in what you guys are doing, it probably makes sense. Um, 
So if you highlight all those walls again, on the top, you can either attach the base or the top to a floor. So if you click that, click that floor, uh, it's going to say delete a million. That's okay. And then depending on where we have that floor, so we move it up or down, the walls automatically update to the bottom of that floor. <coughs> Practice, we typically don't want to do that or don't like to do that uh, for a couple different reasons. One is a lot of our interior walls and exterior walls don't actually go to the bottom of our floor slab. Um, there are specific floor, or excuse me, specific wall types that go directly from the floor to the the bottom of the floor slab. Um, you can do that for sound and whatnot. But a lot of times, project managers whatnot, they like to have everything uh, associated with different constraints um, so that they can adjust and edit. Because if you took every single wall and took them to deck. You gotta remember that your ceiling is about is gonna be about four feet below the bottom of your floor slab. So your client is then paying for four extra feet of wall, and they don't want to do that unless they want to soundproof or just or need to separate um, based on fire code. It's a whole thing. You can either do that. You don't need to do it. Just be cognizant of your constraints, your top constraint, your bottom constraint. Um, to Detach walls. The button right next to it. Just hit detach. Select the. It should only highlight what you've actually attached those walls to. It's going to say can't create the current wall. It can just delete it. It will automatically create another million in that place. The other thing, too, exterior walls aren't typically attached to the bottom of the floor. Exterior walls are actually proud of the uh, edge of the floor slab and go past it. And then they're connected back with some type of connection detail. It's all about, Revit is all about constructability. Now, for what you guys are doing design-wise, it's really just what, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. All right, so we have the, the bottom walls so let's create the top walls so it's pretty much the same idea there's two walls two walls the wood on either side and then the glass and then on the other side wall wood glass so let's do that now go to our level two go to wall let's first select the generic 12 inch so if you have been using a um, couple different walls and you're typically using them, they're going to come on the bottom right hand of the, the drop down under most recently used types. That's an easy way to find your typical or the ones, the type of element that you've been using uh, predominantly. So generic 12 inch. So if you draw and it's on the wrong side of your uh, location line. If you hit space, it'll s switch it over for you. Alright. Uh, talk a little bit about duplicating the family instead of editing. So hit edit and just changing the... the so, let's say... Uh, let's say, let's say, let's say. So... Let's say we have the exterior CMU on metal stud, right? So right now, oops, under structure, it has all the different layers of that wall. We want to create a wall that maybe has a thicker CMU or a different type of AP barrier or something like that. We want to keep all that information in there and be able to edit it, but we want to keep that old wall just in case we want to go back to it or we have those walls integrated within the project and we don't want to change it. That's why we duplicate. All right, and then you can go in, make the changes that you want. It keeps the old floor, but it brings all the information that was in that old um, type in as well. Follow me? Uh, 
All right, so let's do wood plank. Do, do, do. Oops. And then do storefront. I think this has a balcony on it. It does. Let's keep that back a little bit. Then do some more wood plank. And then do generic 12 inch. Sorry, I'm being a little bit confusing. So while you guys are working, the cool thing about Revit is while you're building the model, you're making the floor plan and the section and the elevation so that you generate drawings in one minute after everything is done. Damn straight. <laughs> Cover that last class. Uh, you were here. I wasn't here. I know. It's all right. Just won't pay you for that week. <laughs> um, all right. So if we go, if we go to the three D view, we can see that's been created. Now we can see that the. Uh, in the image in the sketch, the floor to ceiling of, or yeah, the height of the walls are pretty much the same between the two levels, but in ours, the second floor is a taller. And that is because when we create floors, it defaults the bottom of the floor, or excuse me, the top of the floor is at the, the true level. So the top face is at the, the top of the level, which you can see here, but roofs, act the opposite way. Instead of starting at the top and going down, it actually starts at the bottom and goes up. So what we need to do is drop it down 30 inches so it's at the same relationship that the floors are. We can do this two ways. We can either go to, we can highlight the floor, or excuse me, highlight the roof, then go to base constraint and hit negative 30 inches. It will drop that down. Or, since we, I am currently in the, the right orientation within the 3D view, you can actually go in and move things up and down in the vertical plane. So if you hit the move command, select the top face of the roof, go down two and a half feet, it will shift that down as well. That only works if you're in a true orientation. If I was in this, then if I want to move it, it would actually move it in the X, Y. So you have to be in a true vertical orientation to be able to move it in the vertical. Does that make sense? You can also go to an elevation, change it there. Um, but Revit needs to know which plane that you are working in to be able to manipulate the element within that plane. All right, so let's drop it down. Now, when we do drop it down manually, it will come up underneath the properties that it dropped down negative two and a half feet from the base constraint. And then we need to go in and either and select all of our walls on the second floor, and let's attach it to the top constraint. All right, and then really quick, we'll do the same thing for that cantilever. So let's go to level two. And I want that outside face of the wall to be aligned with the floor slab. So go to modify, go to the align tool, hit that edge, and then tab over 
to get the outside edge of the wall. And then let's go back to the image. Oh, you know what? It looks like it's the opposite. Once we're finished with that, we can go in. Now, it's the other thing that's kind of an issue. Oh, goodness. So this is another thing with attaching to the, uh, to the floor slab above, right? So if your wall goes all the way across and goes past whatever you're attaching to, whether that be a floor or a roof, it will then default to whatever constraint you have. So since its constraint is to the roof, it then goes to the roof. Um, there's two ways to fix that. You either do the negative 30 inches from the top constraint. We'll go down. Uh, you can also just move it in. And you can align things within three dimensions as well as in a two-dimensional view. So if you align and then go to the face that you want the element to align to, this is the roof edge, and then tab over to the outside edge of the wall, they'll go in. All right. Now we have basically, it's a little bit more detailed within the sketch, and we can get a little bit more detailed. Um, for your assignment, but for right now we'll keep it pretty basic. So the one other thing uh, that I'll want to include before we move on to how to create um, different drawings is railings. So if we go to the architecture tab, in the middle underneath circulation is railing. Click that guy, see what we have. Uh, glass panel. Let's do that guy. And then essentially we need railing along both edges of the model. Oop. And you'll see if you try and check this right now, it will give you an error. That is because railings require you to have one continuous line across the entire well, path of the, the railing that you want. If you want to create two separate railings, you have to create two, well, you have to create two separate railings. You can't create two separate railings within the same drawing path. So we have to delete this guy, keep this as one continuous element, then we can hit check. It will create that guy. Then we go in the railing component once more. Draw it out, press check, and you now have railings. Now, proportionally, it's a little bit off, but it's pretty close for eyeballing. Um, and then, of course, it has all of these different site elements, which we won't get into right now. Um, we can create topography at a later date, but since we're running a little bit behind, we will move into creating different... Oh, that's one other thing I wanted to show you. How to insert doors into a curtain wall. So, I think we went over this last time, but if we didn't... So, to be able to manipulate... 
uh, Primwall panel, you have to tab into the specific panel that you want. We're in a float plan right now. And then since we have um, a specific panel type uh, labeled for the storefront family, um, it's currently pinned. What that means is if we go in and change the current wall panel from glazed to say solid, if we go to the exterior, it's now changed all of the, let's go back. So now before we change it, you can see through it, it's glass, it's transparent. We change it to solid, it becomes solid. It changes every single panel within that family because they're all tied directly back to the type um, parameter. But if we go in, tab into the panel, and we unpin it, which essentially breaks the link that it has back to the family, that becomes a custom panel now. We can go and manipulate it. But also, if we go in and change the curtain wall panel within the, uh, the family type, change that to solid, it now does not change. So if we go to a 3D view, we can see that panel is still transparent because we broke the link to it that it has to its family while all of the rest remain solid. So just be aware of that when you're going in and unpinning stuff or unpinning uh, the current wall grids or the mullions. It just breaks that link it has to the family. Um, so let's go in. I've unpinned it. I want to make it a door. So I go under the uh, properties tab and it will bring up all the different types of walls as well as hopefully doors. Yep. So we have one door family in there right now. It's a double door. So if we click that, it then brings up a typical door swing. Yep. So all these are different current wall panels. Tab in to select the panel itself or the glass panel itself. Once you have it selected, it should be pinned. So you want to unpin it by either clicking the pin that pops up when you select it or going up to the modify tab and unpinning it there. And then while still having this uh, panel selected, you go up to the properties. And you should have current wall, storefront, double door. Select that. Select that. There you go. And you get two double doors. Do you have a door? That's not good. All right. If you do not see a door, ah. so under edit type, under load. So this is where you can load in a bunch of different families that aren't specifically loaded in to the project currently. You are screwed, dude. The panel's unpinned. Yeah, that's because you selected the mullion and not the glass panel. You've selected the flat one on the side. So it can you have the bottom in, but the so if you're ever confused about what you may or may not have selected yet, so you have this selected right now, you need to select the panel itself. Remember that there are different, there are three different components. Well, there's several different components, but the two big model elements within a current wall system are the mullions in the glass panel. They are separate. They are two completely different architectural elements. And so forth, there are two very different uh, elements within Revit. So make sure you have the correct one selected before you start editing. So, just for shits and giggles, 
let's actually show how you load in another type of family. So under edit type, go to load. It should bring up the families underneath the drawing standards. These are families that should have loaded in when you installed Revit. If you unchecked that uh, families library, it's not going to come up. But you can go into like Revit City, sign up for an account, or you can also go into uh, Autodesk and download the full library of families. But if you have um, installed the families, the family library, it should populate all of these different folders. And then under doors, it will give you all these beautiful different current wall doors. Single doors, frameless doors, double doors. All you got to do is press open. And then it will default to that. You press OK. And then if you go to the exterior, you'll see it's a different type of door. Now, curtain wall doors and regular doors are two different types of elements, different types of families. So if we tried, let's go back in there, and we tried to uh, load in a standard door, which is one of these guys, that you typically would embed in a wall, uh, a standard wall. We try to open that right now. If this works, I'm going to be so mad. It shouldn't work. Yeah. Yep. So it's going to tell you that that family is not of the correct category. That's because you cannot put a standard door in a current wall. It's a different type of family. It's set up slightly differently. Um, so just be aware of that. There's different types. All right. You can do that. Uh, you can do it that way by going into the edit type and loading. You can also go to the insert tab. Up at the top, go to the far right under load family, and then you can load in whatever you want. That will not restrict you from downloading a specific type of category or not. It will allow you to download anything, and then you just have to work your way um, to that specific component, that specific type of family. So right from this view, I could load in a, a wall type, I could load in a window type, I could load in a detail family. It will load in, and then I just have to navigate to that specific family. Yes. When you change the wall to a door, Yeah. No. What do you mean? The key to that bottom wall is now in real life. You have to go in and manually. So. So some of you might, I don't know if this is anybody else did, but um, for his case, for some reason, in his level, the door was not showing up. And the reason it was not showing up is underneath his visibility graphics, 
doors were not selected. So if you go to the right hand side of your view uh, properties, go under the visibility and graphic overrides tab, or type in VG, you'll have model categories selected, and down underneath that, or the majority of them, or whatever you want to see within that specific view. Now, depending on which you created, so I'm sure if we created a door in level two, all of us would be experiencing it because it may have brought in different parameters, um, visibility parameters to that specific level. But if I'd had doors unchecked, the door will be completely, or the door will disappear. Um, and then the only way to bring it back is to go back into the visibility graphics, go to doors, press check, it will pop back up. If you you are if you drew something and you know it should be there and it is not there, that is the first place you should check. All right, really quick. Real quick. All right. The other way to do this, well, one other way to do this. So we've built the roof, the walls, floor slabs, all that stuff the correct way, the, the constructible way. Um, and then you can create different schedules. You can build in different um, floor structures within it. Um, but let's say we just wanted to do a formal expression um, and start to just build it, the geometry of the, the building, um, we can use what is called generic models. And that is under the architecture tab under component. So the component tool, just really quickly, that has all of your different um, like furniture and equipment elements within it. It has different trees, kitchens, all that good stuff. So those are your pre-built families. Ooh, escape out of that. If you do the drop down of that component tool, say model in place. All right. This then allows you to model freely within the, the Revit environment. So if we, and it asks you to pick a category um, for the element that you're about to build. So if you're building a light or you're building a piece of furniture, you would actually specify furniture, light. Um, let's say you're building a car for some reason, you can pick entourage, fire alarms, all that good stuff. For right now, we'll just hit the generic models. That's a pretty blank um, term for whatever. All right, so press OK. And then let's just type in form, whatever name you want. All right, so <coughs> this gets into more of the free form modeling environment of Revit. So you can, let's see, you can build in elevation, you can build in plan, you can build in 3D. Now, um, if you build in 3D, you have to specify the specific um, plane that you're building in. Uh, and to do that, you have to go up here to work plane and hit set. Um, so right now, what I want to build is essentially th this shape, this C shape. Um, and extrude it out. So to do that, I'll hit set. And then it asks you to pick a plane. So if you have a predetermined plane, you can select it from here, or you can pick a plane, which I do a lot. Um, so pick a plane, and then you can actually just select a face of a pre-modeled element and use that as your building plane. And now if you, let's say we go up and hit extrusion and start modeling. Make some funky stuff. It has modeled all of those lines within the plane of that face that we selected. Does that make sense? So if we go in and set reset our plane to the top face, oh, it won't allow us because we already drew stuff. Let's delete this. Let's just X out of here. Set to the top. Pick the plane. And then build a bunch of random stuff. Now if we scroll around, 
it's on that top plane. All right. So since I want to draw the profile of this floor and wall, I want it to be set to that face. So it draws the profile within that plane. Well, you can pick this one. You can pick the one on the wall. Pick the floor. It doesn't matter as long as it's in the same plane. And then you can either, if we go to extrusion, you can either pick lines and then trim and extend all of those guys down. You can draw them manually. It's really whatever you choose. You can also use that true orientation tool to go to a, more of an elevation view. And then once I am finished with my extrusion, press enter. And then afterwards, so you can either manually type in a dimension. So you have a starting dimension and an end dimension. And that is all based on that plane that you selected. So from that face of the, the wall, it's going out one feet. So let's say I want to go inside 20 feet. I do negative 20, press enter, goes in 20 feet. You can also just select the element, come up with these directional arrows from each face of the, the modeled component. You can just manually drag and align it. Then if you finish model, now you have more of a solid component. I show you that. So there's a couple different. If you click it again and go edit in place, the reason I'm showing you this is in the assignment, it's going to ask you to create a custom component. Um, it really is pretty free-for-all, so you can get as complex or as simple as you want. Um, but the one thing I will ask you to do is change the color of the model component to red. So to do that, select the component that you just modeled, and then underneath the, uh, the properties, it'll have a material. Now, just like in a floor structure or wall structure, to be able to manipulate that material, you have to click the far right side of the name. It'll create a... Uh, It'll populate a dot, dot, dot button. It's one of the most hidden and ambiguous parts of Revit for whatever reason. Um, and then we can go up to uh, default. And let's just duplicate that for right now. Type in red. And then under the color of it, the shading color. Click the color, change that to red. And then if we want that to show up as well in our regular drawing uh, field, we can just go to Pattern, Solid Fill, and change the color of that solid fill to red. Once we're done with that, press OK. The material will change to that red material we just created, and it will be red. That's the one big thing that I'm going to ask you to do. Within the... Uh, create a modeling place component. There's a bunch of different tools for creating different forms. I encourage you guys to explore them, play around with them, model some cool shit. All right, so cancel model, delete it. All right, so really quickly, We're going to create a section. We have already have elevations, but I'll show you how to create a custom one. I'll create a perspective and then create a true 3D axon drawing. So to create a section, we'll go to the View tab and then do Section, draw it wherever we want it. And then underneath Sections, it is now populated that view. So unlike uh, levels where you have to go in and create the, the plan, floor plan associated with the level, when you create a section, it automatically creates a view associated with it. And then you can either double click underneath the project browser, that section, 
or you can double click the head of the section, that arrow, and it will go to that section. And then you can start to manipulate the scale of the drawing. You can also, and we'll get into this a little bit later, start to create or manipulate the graphics of the drawing to create some poche, create some line work and uh, line widths, as well as the shading. That's really <coughs> Real quickly, turn on shadows. It's this button down here, right next to the scale. If you hover over, it's to the right of the sun. Turn that on, turn that off. You can manipulate that based on different settings. Get into it later. Um, let's create a elevation. So now that we have modeled elements, it will automatically snap to whichever element our mouse is closest to. So if we wanted to get a <laughs> interior elevation of that one little wall, since our mouse is closest, closest to that wall, it snaps directly perpendicular to it. Um, for right now, we can just click on one of the larger faces. And then before we go into the elevation, if we click the arrow key, it will show you the extents of that elevation. So we can manipulate that here. Then if you double click the head, it will go in, show you an elevation. Uh, typically, we'll just draw, in, in practice, we'll just draw a ground plane in there. Um, that's using some of the annotate or the 2D drawing tools that we have here. It's called a filled region. If you click it, it comes up with your drawing environment. You can draw a closed boundary of whatever you want. And then it will create a solid pattern. And then you can change it underneath. So if you want it to be solid black, we could do that. All right. Two more things. Perspective. So setting up perspectives, it's actually like taking a picture, um, literally. Under view, if you go to the drop down of the 3D view, the house uh, icon, it's a camera tool. So if you click that, you want to click wherever you want that um, perspective to be originated from. So you click that, and then you drag it, and essentially what this is showing is the extents of the view range, so how wide of an angle that camera is going to be, and then the extents of what you're shooting. So right now, if I were to just put the, the camera right to that corner, it's only going to capture... Oh, just kidding, it's going to capture all of it. Oops. Go back to level one. Oh, it's because of that. So do that over again. One more time. Camera. And it gives you a view range. So you can change the view range of it um, by just editing the boundary of this guy. Now, you got to be careful. Depending on how close your camera is to the object that you want to, uh, the perspective to be, if you take those boundaries and start to pull them, if you're really close to it, it's going to warp um, the, the perspective of that object. All right, so just be careful of that. Um, may that little, sorry, when you're in plain view, is that the pink dot or purple mm -hmm. Somewhat, yeah. It's the center. So... Um, if you're taking a picture, the center of the camera, that's where that pink dot is. And then depending on how you manipulate the clipping boundary, you always know that the center of the camera is there. So your truest... Um, but, but like, if you pull that too close to the camera, will it fish eye the distance? No, so if you... It won't fish eye, uh, but if you pull this camera really close to the object, so this controls the direction of the, the camera and the center of it. This controls the depth of the range. So if we had it pulled back really close, 
And then we went into that 3D view. It's cutting off where that depth is. The other thing is since it is so close, just pull that view back out. Since it is so close, if we tried to capture all of it, it looks super warped. Kind of like a fisheye, not as rounded. Um, one other thing to remember, um, let's undo that a couple times. There we go. Um, the other thing to remember when you're doing perspectives is that it um, you have an eye elevation and a target elevation that you can manipulate. So it automatically defaults to five foot six inches above the view that you've taken the camera from. That is your typical eye level of a full grown male. Uh, females are going to be a little bit shorter. Um, but the target elevation is where you're looking. So kind of like that red um, dot is the center of the camera in your horizontal. Uh, the target elevation is your center dot for your vertical. So if we change that to 20 feet, it's going to change it and angle it up. Um, the one thing that you do, or the one thing that happens when you change the eye elevation and the target elevation to two separate elevations is that your verticals are no longer vertical. They actually angle out and it becomes a two point perspective. So when you want a true perspective, make sure that both of them whoops, are at the same height. And you get true verticals. All right, one last thing. Ooh, he's excited. Um, is a true axon. So to create that, the way I do it, is I just go to my default 3D view. I duplicate it. And then I go to whatever orientation I want to happen. So the one thing with perspective, it's an actual perspective. With this uh, default 3D, it's a true axonometric. So you can get it to the correct orientation that you want it. And then if you don't want it to move from this specific orientation, there's a tool down at the bottom. It is has a, what does it have? It has a house, so it's the 3D view uh, icon, and then a padlock next to it. Unlocked 3D view is what happens. Uh, if you click that, save orientation and lock view, then you cannot manipulate the perspective that it is in, or the orientation, excuse me, that it's in. The only way to then change it is to go back in and unlock the view, and you can manipulate it. So, what I will be asking you guys to do for the assignment is to submit PDFs of each view, several views. To do that, you can go in File, Print, and then go to uh, one of your uh, PDF creators, virtual PDF creator, Adobe, Bluebeam, um, may have default on your computer that's different than mine and then under setup this is where you'll select the size of the paper that you want to print on and the scale so if you want it to be this true scale of whatever view that you're in you go to zoom and hit a hundred percent if you want it to just fit within the page size that you've selected it fits page, it will default to the center of the paper. You can manipulate portrait and landscape if you so choose. Hit OK. And then under the left, under print range, just make sure that you have current window selected. It will then print whatever view that you have open currently. So we have the first floor plan open right now. It will print the level one print, uh, floor plan. You can also select multiple views and print it at one time if you do selected views you can go in check whichever ones that you want to print press ok and then 
up here, combine multiple files. If you hit combine multiple files, that will combine it into one PDF. If you create separate files, it will create separate PDFs for each individual view. So they don't want to do that. So let's just do current window for right now. Press OK. Pop up with the window, whatever you want it named, wherever you want it to be saved. Hit save. And then it will do its thing, create the PDF. So the assignment. That's why I don't have Adobe PDF. Publish. So, first assignment, if it will open, is to create the other two elevations of this house. So we have created two of them. The other two are blank. Go in, use your imagination and your creativity, and come up with whatever elevations you want. Um, so a couple of things. It needs to have a new wall type. So you need to create a new wall type, just like we did with the wood plank. Come up with a different material, a different pattern, and utilize it. Create a new kern wall system. So you can go in, change the spacing of the kern wall. You can change the default kern wall panel if you want. Um, new grid spacing, mullion sizes. Um, have at least one kern wall door integrated within it. At least one curved wall element, which I forgot I didn't. Uh, show you so I'll show that real quick and then a custom generic model that's what we just did um, that we made red make sure that you change the material to red to highlight it can be sculptural element a wall a roof something funky it doesn't matter as long as there is something in there and then the deliverables are elevations of the two new facades two floor plans level one level two 3d axonometric and a perspective any questions and then it's pretty easy to create a curved wall element. It's literally just the, you can either do the start end radius arc, which I typically do, or start end radius. Just do that, click. It can be any wall type, it doesn't need to be a curved wall. It can be anything. As long as it, so, as long as a, so it, Revit is not very happy with uh, like NURBS curves or something like that. Um, it likes true curves with a specific radius. Um, you can do, you can't do it with walls, but for some elements, like if you were to create a custom wall component and you were in the prof like a profile of extrusion, you can actually create a spline or a, no um, a node-based curve, um, but it's, it's a pain in the butt because other than that specific line, if you offset that line or if you moved it or copied it or tried to trim it, it won't. The information won't translate. So then it is a pain in the ass. So try and just do true curves, at least for right now. All right, and you can go in. And don't have millions and just create a straight. Yeah. So since we have five foot spacing, it automatically creates a joint at five feet. But if we did not, so we had none, did a curve. So this can create a straight wall. You need to then go in and create kern wall to then follow that profile. Chrome walls are faceted, as in is most curved elements in the real world. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes. So, um, a new curved wall with your curved uh, wall, how does the model look for balancing? Uh, everything is under canvas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so everything, all the assignments, everything is done through Canvas. You will upload those PDFs onto Canvas. It will be graded on Canvas by Allah, so be nice to him. Um, 